My father and my mother had a small glass workshop. My father was a grinder and mirror maker. So where edges had to be polished or bevels had to be grounded or where mirrors had to be re relayed or laid, this was uh, the, the workshop of Hugo Moye. When World War II started, I was three and a half years old. My father was um, uh, drawn uh, to, the, to be a, a soldier. Uh, my mother uh, uh, ran the small workshop that existed in Hamburg, a glass workshop. And uh, uh, so this went, went on uh, as, as good as it was possible uh, to do. What are your earliest memories of your early childhood? Well, uh, when it does come to those, uh, it's the bombing nights in, uh, over Hamburg in the early uh, years of the war. In broad daylight, mighty squadrons roar across the North Sea. Over Hamburg, Germany's principal seaport and number one war center, tons of bombs rain from the sky. Aerial photographs show the results. Seven square miles of Hamburg's war industries, docks, military installations, flattened and in ruins. Water mains, gas and electric plants destroyed. Hamburg as a war center, a base for submarines, is virtually wiped off the map. Well, the house and workshop were, were separate from each other. The workshop survived, fortunately, and during the war, first my mother ran the workshop with some workmen who were not drawn into the, uh, in, into the war. And uh, this worked until the home was bombed out, and I think my mother then passed the responsibility on to one of these men. She found work in the area, there was a large steel work, and uh, she worked there with the canteen. And this is why uh, I then, as a small child with four and a half years, as so many children from Hamburg, had been sent out to foster parents in other parts of Germany, which were not affected by the war. So I ended up close to Dresden in a village, and there I have my first impression of a country life because I ended up on a farm and I was as a four and a half year one uh, in foster care uh, in the woods <laughs> so to speak and I must say I have very fond memories of, of these years they were, were wonderful something that I never would have experienced in a city life. You were separated from all the family when you went out there? Oh yes, oh yes. There was no family in the area. From Hamburg it's about away 350 kilometers, but it's a total different dialect. When my mother came to visit, she was uh, surprised that with her I spoke the dialect of uh, someone from Hamburg and with the people I spoke the dialect of Saxonian, where I lived. <laughs> Not many people lived there. As a child, you're on your own. And that's what I, what I possibly learned, to be on my own, to be occupied anyway. I never have been bored in my life. Uh, there always has been something uh, I could draw from. And when it does come to the worst, I must be able to draw for myself. <laughs> and I think uh, that, that may be one gift that has this uh, countryside presented to me, that I have learned to go into the, into, into the woods, to be on my own and to uh, appreciate and to adventure. It was once when my mother came up and we brought her back to the, uh, to the train and she was hugging me and uh, then I said, oh, El El Elspeth, Elspeth, she wants to take me, please, please, please. <laughs> Elspeth was one of the daughters of the farmer. And so I, I, I feared that my mother wanted to take me back to Hamburg. <laughs> so I, I, it must have been a, a happy time there. Did you see your father very much during those years? No, he, uh, he came once over, uh, once he had a, a, a little holiday and we saw him. That was the only time. I saw him. Be between 
four and a half and nine years uh, it was just this one one time that we had contact with him, direct contact. But there was uh, certainly the, the usual contact via letters and you, you didn't phone at the, in those years. You, this was the only ma uh, way how to, how to be in contact. As far as I know, he was stationed in Holland, so he was not far away from our place. And uh, he was, which is wonderful, he was, was a chef <laughs> in the army. And uh, so he had a relatively good life when it does come to, to the eating. <laughs> But uh, otherwise, uh, I can't assume that any uh, life with the army is, is very uh, amusing. I had to walk to the school about uh, three and a half kil kilometers over the highway. And so we, we, have, we were very much aware of the fights in the air and uh, the, the, uh, the Russian uh, fighter jets, they, they flew down the highways and they nailed down what they ever could nail down. And so it was always this tuck, 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 tuck. that is, uh, came up to you and uh, just jumped to the side of the road and, and got into, uh, into the woods. Later, after the uh, f fatal bombing of, of, of Hamburg, my mother came as well because uh, then our home was bombed and uh, so she came over to, to join me. In the, that was in the last year of the war. And then certainly towards the end of the war, uh, when the fighting crew, uh, troops of the uh, Soviet ar army uh, came through and occupied the villages and took off with the cows and whatever was there. And uh, this uh, certainly is, is still in, in your memory, but uh, I, even as a kid, was involved to clean out the food stock of, of the army-occupied warehouses. So I, I ran home from the next village with a bag of sugar on my, uh, on my shoulder, and we, at least we had sugar and we had something to bargain for. After the downfall of the, of the Third Reich, we wanted to go back to Hamburg again, and uh, we also would, uh, hoped we would find my father there. So uh, we grabbed a little handcart and put all our possession on, onto the handcart and started walking towards uh, Dresden and uh, then on towards uh, uh, down the Elbe stream to Hamburg. These were the times where everyone was on the move. Sometimes we had a little bit of transport and other times we just had to walk. And uh, we were lucky enough to uh, go through the uh, Soviet-occupied zone with, with any problems and uh, ended up in Hamburg, which was uh, occupied by the British. And uh, when we arrived, my father had already uh, come through. He was only briefly in, interned as a soldier and uh, then set free by the English and uh, was uh, sitting already in the, in the kitchen of this, his workshop and uh, uh, was just brewing a coffee when we came. <laughs> so this was, uh, was very nice to, uh, to be back uh, in Hamburg. This was a city that was in ruins. The whole area where we lived, where not many houses left, uh, most of it was in ashes. Uh, we were neighborhood of a uh, of a, of a part of the city where, from a whole suburb, there were just two houses standing. One was a church. And the other one was in this industrial building, but everything else was in ruins. And this was the a suburb where the working families lived, and hardly anyone uh, had come out during the bombing out of this suburb. And it was an endless view, an endless view of ruins and just this one needle sticking out, the church that was not bombed. Hamburg was rebuilding and cleaning up the streets, cleaning up the, the ruins, the half-standing houses, which had to be uh, demolished before they could be carried away. 
kids of different upbringing came together, climbing into half-destroyed houses. And it sounds adventurous, and it certainly was, uh, but certainly not a good upbringing for, for any child. All their one focus was surviving and building up again. It was not so that you had, uh, let's say, a church community or a club community, or uh, there was no hold between people. There was, a, I think, there was too much that, uh, that had gone on uh, that people were thinking of it. Uh, I think uh, surviving uh, was the most uh, important thing. I think that everyone was trying for himself, as it is uh, still today. I would say a very self-centered society. I was reading uh, the the stories of the uh, these uh, adventurers who went out uh, to Australia, who went out uh, in, into Asia, and uh, my grandfather, who was a captain and uh, traveled all the countries, and uh, the stories that I heard. So uh, I assumed uh, that I possibly uh, would become a seafarer. I never I never pursued that. We are talking now the, the age between uh, nine when I arrived in, in Hamburg and the age of 15, I would say, which is uh, pretty, pretty important in the, in the development. The main thing that I, I can remember uh, that hit me was that I uh, developed a polio in, in arms and legs and uh, went to hospital for three quarters of a year. And it was, was my first experience with, with pain and uh, my first experience with, uh, uh, with overcoming pain. And this was a total new ex experience for me. And it is an experience that I have very much learned from, that uh, you have to, um, you have, that you have to roll with the balls as they come. And just to build up strength of my body, I started swimming and did this uh, in a swimming club, which my, uh, my mother actually had joined when she was a girl. And I built up physical strength and uh, I became a rather good swimmer and uh, champion uh, also in some areas. Uh, I was, I was uh, doing freestyle and backstroke. My, my, my biggest achievement was a long distance uh, a champion in Hamburg of the different uh, uh, clubs. But it was also, again, it's local, but Hamburg is a big city, so uh, it, is, uh, it was something, yes. I, I really must say I value this this time very much because I, I, I believe uh, in these years I learned about discipline, selfless discipline, more than than about any, anything else. The uh, experience with the hospital and and the experience uh, in swimming, I think, have formed me very strongly for the future. I had friends that uh, brought me into a Christian group, a youth group. I lived with this group and we were a very progressive group there and became later also a leader of one of the youth uh, groups. So uh, I was very embedded in the whole philosophy of the uh, uh, Lutheran uh, church there. I developed a um, connection to a, um, a, how would you say that, to a Christian um, Christian basis of, of living. I, I must say, I, I learned there about humanity more than I learned about uh, a Christian doctrine. And by then already I had also entered my father's workshop as an apprentice. I think it was a convenience. The workshop was there and uh, without seeing a, a final aim there, I just went into it. That I, in the end, made something out of it uh, is fantastic, uh, but was not planned from the very beginning. Uh, but the only thing that was seen was that I possibly could take over this workshop at a later age, which didn't happen. My name's Maggie Patari. I'm a glass artist, uh, independent curator and writer. You know, there was no sense that, that there would be this fantastic 
flowering and blossoming of, a, of an artistic career. But he had that, that desire to do very, very well and that sort of Lutheran work ethic so that within his apprenticeship he strove to be the best that he could anyway. And of course he, be, he was Apprentice of the Year, German Apprentice of the Year, very significant. And this opened then a chapter for me, which was the, the next step in my development, where I learned about the beauty of glass in a glass school that I joined. I had uh, in this school came to meet all these teachers, which were teachers already before these schools were founded in, West, in Western Germany. These uh, teachers came from glass schools that were located before the war in Bohemia. For me, it was a, uh, a unbelievable fundus of uh, ideas, a fundus of uh, gaining vocabulary in my, my approach toward glass, that I must say this was a moment where I was the first time confronted with the beauty of the material. I think from then on, there was no stopping to go for the beautiful side of glass. That's why I found uh, something I really wanted to excel. You know, people sort of tend to think of Klaus as being part of a dynastic setup. Klaus, in fact, didn't have any, any encouragement as far as from the artistic side, from home. He loved art books and he was very curious. And so he followed his own curiosity. I asked him once how his father felt about him then going on and having this entirely different career and going off in another direction altogether. And he said, you know, that he didn't ever really talk to him about it. They didn't ever manage to have that conversation. You know, perhaps his father was disappointed, but I think he, he was quite happy to see him excel. In some, you know, the, the excelling was more important than just taking over the business. At the end of the three years, I um, gained my master's certificate, and uh, it was the, the actually at that time the, the best that ever came through in the school in Hadamar, where I ended up. The most significant thing is that he met Isgard Volgamuth there, who was his first wife, and it was with Isgard that he had his initial career in glass in Germany. They were a double act, really. Uh, she got her certificate in glass painting and they worked together on collaborative pieces and had quite a fantastic practice and, and were very prestigious and famous in Germany for their glass work. And at that stage, of course, Klaus was also very interested in music. Well, the musical interest started off in the, in the, in the 50s. It started off with... Um, putting into, into music the lyrics of, of others, like uh, it could be Heinrich Heine, it could be uh, Grasshoff, it could be one, one of the contemporary uh, writers and uh, poets. Isgard's mother, Klaus's mother-in-law, Hildegard Volgemuth, was a left-wing activist and she was part of a group of left-wing writers and poets who lived in the Ruhr area of Germany. And he also started to write music for his mother-in-law's activist poetry. And he became very, very popular all the way through the 60s and into the 70s. Bulgemuth was a member of the Dortmunder Gruppe, which was a, um, a group of, um, of writers uh, who were connected to the mining industry. And uh, it was mainly coal mining in the area, and uh, so um, most of it came out of the industrial uh, urban um, discussion and uh, industrial urban problematic. This was a group which uh, was also influenced by the uh, Lutheran Church. It was not just a red union movement, it was uh, also a church movement. And I came out of the uh, Lutheran youth movement. Hildegard Wohlgemuth uh, wrote the lyrics, uh, I made the music. I did it because I wanted to sing. Wir armen, armen Kinder, wir haben so viel Zeit. Doch gehen wir auf den Rasen, ist einer da, der schreit. Weg, 
da du wicht. Na, hörst du, hörst du, hörst du nicht? Das ist verboten, das ist verboten. When we had made this uh, LP, then the question is, okay, where, where from there? And I would have to go on the road and uh, would have to promote this LP day and night and club to club and pub to pub and whatsoever. And this is exactly what I didn't want to do. I had a family, I had two children. So the pendulum went over to the glass that I worked on at the same time. Glass art was still nascent. It was only just beginning. I think in 62, Harvey Littleton and Dominic Labino held workshops at the Toledo Art Museum and experimented pretty much with blowing glass. Uh, when Klaus started uh, making he, his work with Isgard um, was really quite conventional in so far as they would go to the Hessen glass factory, buy crystal blanks, and then she would paint them and he would carve them and etch them. But they started to experiment And he and Isgard, courtesy of his old Christian group, the Lutheran group, got a commission for a uh, church window. And it was very significant because in actual fact the window was being designed by Lothar Schreier, who was one of the Bauhaus master painters. Lothar Schreier was commissioned to do a meditation window uh, of Father, Son and uh, Holy Spirit. Uh, he was a very old man then. He was in his 80s. What did you get from him, from working with him? It was the personality, I, I would say, the personality of, of a man who has been involved in, uh, in a movement which has been a leading factor throughout the world for the development of the arts and the development of the crafts because uh, the Bauhaus saw the, the craft movement and the arts movement as equal within its structure. There was a respect for creativity. Uh, as, as a matter of fact, I, despite the cult of the person within the, in the Bauhaus philosophy, but where I, where I agree fully on the issues of uh, the acceptance of the material and, uh, uh, and, and, and form and research and so on and so on, Bauhaus developed a, like, a, like a religion. And I think this is a very a big danger when you have ideals when you change the ideals into ideologies. And I think the Germans are very good with that, that the ideas changed into ideologies. And uh, the moment you do that, you kill the idea, the basic ideas. And so that was why I, why I separate myself very much in thinking, uh, in the thinking of Bauhaus and uh, Bauhaus' continuation. <laughs> And so we realized these windows and we did a few beautiful restorations. One was leading us to Amman, actually. We drove with a Citroën down to Amman from Hamburg because we needed to take with us all the material, first of all, uh, to, the, to the Gulf of Aqaba. And you drive through the desert, it is only reddish sand, rocks, a few plants, dried out plants and nothing else. And you, after a day's drive, you arrive at the Gulf of Aqaba, you come to the water's edge and there's still nothing going on, but you're so dried out that you want to take a swim. So you go to the water and you have your mask on, you dip your head into the water and my God, There's a whole new world there. Suddenly, out of nothing, it has a glowing color, fish and corals. And it is so un unbelievable rich what has happened under the water that, that is hitting you like a, like, like a bomb. It is an explosion that is approaching you. And so I was uh, out of my mind, I must say. 
We also came to Jerusalem and there I saw some of the Arabic windows. There's this, this, this com combination of into your life from this color. Then you see these windows, which were actually plaster constructions. Out of the plaster, they were sketched out openings. And these openings were filled in with colored glass, either glass uh, that was new or glass, old glass that was found, antique glass, colorful, red or, or whatever, or it could be just the bottom of a bottle that is, uh, is built in there. But in this unbelievable light, in contact with the plaster, these, these windows were glowing and uh, of such a beauty that it was a total different experience of color than I have had it anywhere else. When you look at the aesthetic of the European church window, then you have this tone and tone working, uh, the washing over of colors. And uh, this had nothing to do with it. It was so elementary and so strong that this has left a... Uh, has engraved lines into my brain, I must say. And up to date, I'm, I'm, uh, I think I'm working with, with these elements that I came up to me then. At this stage, Moyer glass was the pinnacle of German glass, so that visiting heads of state would be given a piece of Moyer glass. In 1973, when he went you know, on one of his habitual visits to the Hessen glass factory to pick up some more blanks, and he spied out of the corner of his eye a stack of, um, of glass rods. So I, I took a bundle of these, of different canes, as they are called, with me. These canes were used to make buttons or, ju uh, or jewelry out of it. Then over the next few years, I experimented, was melting down, was cutting into them and then melting, until I came to a point where I made a, a mold, not a, knowing what kind of material one would use for a mold, and uh, laid out pieces of these canes and fused them, uh, fused them together. But uh, somehow I had hit a technique that was familiar to early Egyptian techniques. It was familiar possibly to Venetian techniques in some ways. It, it was familiar to some techniques that were tried but unsuccessfully in the United States by Carter in, at Stu Ben Glass. But the point of this is nowhere you found a uh, report uh, through what kind of problems these different uh, areas worked themselves to have a successful work. And he really did have to start from scratch. These days, everybody does fuse glass because, of course, they've got a how-to manual, thanks to Klaus Moyer. And he spent two years experimenting, figuring out the compatibility, figuring out how to use them, figuring out the viscosity of the material. And by then, he'd found a visual language of his own. From then on, he and his guard went their separate ways, really, and Klaus started this fabulous kiln-forming technique. My name's Nigel Lendon and I'm uh, a friend and colleague of Klaus's. He has almost single-handedly, internationally, influenced the development of studio glass art because his techniques and his processes that he's developed sits halfway between the European tradition of casting and cold working and the Venetian and American tradition of blowing and forming that way but he actually invented this kiln form technique which required technological advances and a huge amount of experimentation to get to the stage where colour would work like this, where it would sit together without snapping once it cooled down. So Klaus has sort of created a third, a third method of making studio glass which didn't exist before. He was top of his field. He was famous in Germany as a glass artist. And at that stage, Chihuly had invited him to teach at Pilchuk. At the Pilchuk Glass School, which is an international glass school, which is a summer school in the Seattle area. 
there I was confronted with the glass scene that was far away from what I did. I was very separate with uh, my, my fusing attempts and uh, my specific kind of work, whereas the, the, the general trend was towards the fire, was towards the glass blowing, which is uh, so much more interesting to watch, which has this theatrical moment in the making. But it, it was this, this freedom that the Americans took which um, uh, we didn't have in, in, in Europe. My pieces uh, were not ashamed of using color anymore. When I came back, the, my, the size grew. And uh, so it didn't care anymore what others thought. It, it came only to the point that you did what you wanted to do. And I must say, this is a kind of a freedom that the Americans provided me, me with. <laughs> He had that um, Lutheran imperative to give back, but he felt that, you know, he was at the apex of his practice. And he decided that he really wanted to teach more and more and more, and he was being invited to give workshops more and more and more. So he had this sense of, of serious fulfilment, and um, the question was where to go from there. His relationship with his guard was finished, both personal and professional relationship was finished. And because he was um, teaching at a number of places in Europe and America, he started to realise that there was a big gap between the uptight European or German approach to technique and skill and the rather too loose American approach, which was sort of organic and, and sort of madly loose. And he, he just felt that really there needed to be, you know, a balance to it all. And he, so he started to have quite a vocational bent and almost a, a missionary zeal about bringing the two together. And so, uh, as it turned out, just at that time, the Canberra School of Art was being formed under the directorship of Udo Selbach. I'm David Williams. I was a director of the ANU's School of Art, formerly the Canberra School of Art. Glass, which I think was very embryonic in the Australian context, I think was, must have presented Udo with a bit of a challenge. The challenge, of course, would be to start from scratch. The others had a bit of a grounding, but uh, this was a workshop that needed somebody with the drive and the foresight to get the thing going. I decided that I wanted to spend about 10 years of my, my life with teaching because uh, I had the feeling that I had something to give, something to uh, give, give back what I, what I learned, and uh, so that this, this knowledge was passed on. And then suddenly came this, this phone call came from Australia and uh, offering me a situation where I could start a glass program from scratch, which I thought was uh, uh, quite fantastic. So I was open uh, to the invitation and uh, explained that I uh, wanted to give 10 years, but not more than that. The then director, Udo Selbach, came over to Germany and uh, we found out that we had quite similar ideas. He was uh, also educated in, in Germany and uh, educated in a, in a kind of uh, Bauhaus uh, style uh, and employed this kind of workshop system into the Kemmer School of Art. Uh, so. Uh, that does mean that any head of workshop, as I would, would uh, as I would be then, uh, would have its very own little kingdom, and uh, had the freedom to develop the curricula the way he or she uh, wanted to do it. I, I said yes, even without testing Australia first. And so, class arrived in about 1982. I think it was. I think the. Uh, uh, opportunity to develop something from the ground up uh, with the ambition of making this a nationally and an internationally recognised program was the sort of attraction that uh, obviously uh, Klaus was keen to pick up. He had met Brigitte Anders, the ceramicist, and they fell in love and started a relationship. And so all of this stuff just sort of dovetailed at the right time. Udo turning up and offering Klaus the job also cemented Klaus and Brigitte's relationship because he didn't want to go alone. He'd just met this marvellous woman. And so, of course, he asked Brigitte if she would be prepared to go to the other end of the world with him, to Australia, the other end of the earth, you know, a place that neither of them had ever considered going to. 
And so, of course, she accepted and that was the beginning of the building of their serious relationship. And they came out together to start a new life and a new family. They had the twins and they both embraced Australia wholeheartedly. My name is Richard Whiteley. I'm the current head of the Glass Workshop at the School of Art. I think Klaus certainly was in the right place at the right time, and so was the School of Art. Klaus was a, a, a brilliant recruit in building a new uh, program that was different to what had existed before in, in teaching Glass. It was something that Klaus was very clear about when he got here and he started to unravel his philosophy. He didn't believe in um, a way of teaching that had been so pervasive in places like North America. He wanted people to come in and to, to really focus on the material in a different way. When I arrived, there was nothing there, but I had with me my whole studio equipment. I put up my kilns, my grinding tools, uh, my diamond saw, and so on, and we all could, could work with it. But the advantage for the students really was that they saw me also working by having this studio set up so that, that students could use my equipment. Uh, we also learned immediately from me as a maker as well as from me as, as a teacher. I believe in the balance of uh, creativity and skill. I tried to assure my students that uh, skill uh, is a means to realize creative ideas and I think this is something that has been understood because there's practically no one in Australia who is mimicking my work. There are these very strong individuals within Australia and have developed this high individuality in the making and in their creativity. So I have students who have passed my ability by miles and have created own areas for themselves by using skill in partnership with creativity, yes. Australia was so lucky to get Klaus, America could have got him. My name's Kirsty Ray, I'm an artist working in Canberra. Um, I work predominantly with glass and my connection to Klaus goes right back to his first years here in Canberra when I was um, one of the first students at the Canberra School of Art. Pilchuk and the people running it were aware of the European masters and the knowledge and skill they had. And that's what America lacked. America had, you know, the studio glass movement starting in 1962 and, you know, the hippies that worked through that and the kind of funky glass that they created. But what they didn't have, again, was a lot of that skill and tradition. And so they looked to Europe for that. And I think that's been so beneficial for Australian glass that we didn't come from either and we did get this collaboration in a way, the, both those things pouring in, the American studio glass movement and the tradition in Europe. So I think we've been really lucky. Whilst we haven't been tied to a tradition of glass making or history, um, that have kind of boxed in some of the, some of the areas of glass making, I think, especially in Europe. You know, that classic thing when people say, oh, you know, Australia, we're 10 years behind everything. Well, we were in glass then too. The thing about Klaus is that he's so pivotal in both international and Australian glass history. Klaus gave us parity internationally. He transformed the Australian glass scene, really. We definitely, uh, in, in our field of, of glass, uh, have become a world player. Australian glass is so highly regarded worldwide that we can say that the involvement of uh, government and university system into the development of glass has been highly successful. We are talking about a human achievement here and we are talking about uh, the spiritual side of life. It's a package that the, uh, that the arts bring with them. We bring joy, we bring um, recognition of a, uh, of a cultural life, of a cultural experience into the country which make us proud, yeah.